Hi everyone, my name is Tom Pettit and welcome to this episode of Beyond Come Follow Me. This week in your Come Follow Me lesson, you are studying the doctrines that are being taught in 2 Nephi chapters 26 through 30. And I am really excited to talk to you for a minute about these chapters for a few reasons. One, because of the incredible doctrine that's being taught, where the Lord is speaking to us about the necessity of the Book of Mormon in our day. And secondly, the Lord goes through, or Nephi goes through some prophecies of the last days that are very specific. And those specific events, a lot of them have already taken place, and we now call that church history. And so I've got a bunch of church history stories to share with you as well, to show that what Nephi was prophesying about actually did come about as recorded in the histories of the church. So this is a great week, and I'm excited for it. The Lord here is talking more about the Book of Mormon. It's what he's been talking about the last few weeks as well. And once again, he's reiterating why the Book of Mormon is such a necessity in the last days, and specifically for us, why it was specifically why it was written for us and for our day. And but but this time the Lord is going to add in some warnings, some warnings that really haven't come up in the previous reading assignments. And those warnings have to do with those who reject the Book of Mormon and the danger of not giving more attention to the Book of Mormon. So all those things taken together are going to be in this video and I'm excited for it. Now pictured behind me is the reconstructed home of Joseph and Emma Smith at the Priesthood Restoration Site in Harmony, Pennsylvania. I've got this picture behind me because it was here at this location where 75% of the Book of Mormon was translated by the prophet. That's pretty incredible. Um, so when we say the coming forth of the Book of Mormon or the Lord brought forth the Book of Mormon, well, we can say the majority of it came geographically right here from this location, which is, is awesome. All right, so let's get into it. Second Nephi chapter 26 is where we're going to begin. And in verses 8 and 9 is where we, we find the Lord beginning or opening up this reading assignment with promises given to us again about those who hearken to him and to the voice of his prophets. Because those who will hearken, not just listen, but listen and do as invited by the Lord or his prophets, the Lord promises that those people will have peace and that they will be healed. And then he gives a warning in verse 10 that those who choose not to hearken to the Lord or to his prophets, they do so because of pride. Their pride gets in the way. And their pride is so built up in their heart and their mind that they say, Lord or president of the church, I know better than you. And so I'm going to do it my way and not your way. And that is what the Lord is warning against. We find President Nelson, or excuse me, President Benson, who spoke a lot about the sin of pride. And I've got two quotes here that really go hand in hand with what the Lord is warning about in regards to pride and that pride being used to reject his word or the words of his prophets. The first of two quotes from President Nelson, pride is concerned with who is right. Humility is concerned with what? is right. Sometimes the truth can be hard to hear. And so do we say, well, that you, I'm, I'm right. That doesn't sound good. I like my way better. Or the opposite of pride, being humble and saying, you know what, I'm going to find out what is right. Even if it bothers me, even if I don't like the answer, I'm going to figure out what is right and do my best to go along with that or not just go along with it, but to accept it. And then the second quote from President Benson about pride. Most of us think pride, think of pride as self-centeredness, conceit, boastfulness, arrogance, or haughtiness. All of these are elements of sin, but the heart or core is still missing. The central feature of pride is enmity, enmity toward God and enmity toward our fellow men. I think that's a great description of what the Lord is teaching in 2 Nephi 26 verse 10. Now, understanding this, this is kind of a foundational base of everything that's to come. The Lord says, hey, you listen to me and my prophets, this is what you get. If you don't, it's because of your pride, and you're going to find out what you get here and later in the reading assignment. And so we got to remember this established foundation, really, that we've got here. And as we build upon that, we find that the Lord has taught I'm going to give you my word. You're going to accept it. I'm going to heal you. I'm going to bless you. You don't. It's because of your pride. 
And now on top of that, for the spirit of the Lord, in regards to a person's pride, the spirit of the Lord will not always strive with man. And when the spirit ceaseth, ceaseth to strive with man, then cometh speedily destruction, and this grieveth my soul, says Nephi. I've got to include President Nelson's quote here. As we recap, first, if we fail to listen to the Lord, it's because of our pride. And when we allow pride to get into our way, then we lose the spirit. And President Nelson says, in the coming days, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. So how can we, or excuse me, what can we do to counter this by speedily increasing the spirit in our lives? In verse 11, there's the warning of the speedy destruction when we lose the spirit. So how do we counter that by speedily increasing the spirit in our lives? Well, we find the answer just in the next verse, verse 12. And here, the Nephi says, And as I spake concerning the convincing of the Jews that Jesus is the very Christ, it must needs be that the Gentiles be convinced also that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God. You know what this makes me think of? It sounds really familiar to the title page of the Book of Mormon, which says that the Book of Mormon was written, quote, to the convincing of the Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. The Book of Mormon is the key. The Book of Mormon is what, let's go back through the verses backwards. If we read the Book of Mormon, we have the Spirit in our lives. If we have the Spirit in our lives, we don't have pride. If we don't have pride, we listen to the Lord and His representatives. And as we listen, we are healed by Him. The Book of Mormon is the key to everything. And then we get down to verses 16 through 19, and this, uh, these verses speak about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Then in verse 24, <clears throat> in verse 24, um, everything that the Lord, it, it's taught that everything that the Lord or His prophets ask us to do is because He loves us. So here He's saying, listen to me, that's one invitation. Get rid of pride, that's another invitation. Number three, get the Spirit. Number four, read the Book of Mormon. So, so far, there's been four invitations extended to us. And the Lord says, listen, I'm asking you to do things because of the love that he has for us. He invites us to do things by saying, now in verse 25, come unto me, all ye ends of the earth. Each invitation to do something has this attached to it, the promise of love. I want you to do this because I love you. If you do that, you'll feel more, you'll feel an increase of my love in your life. So anytime we see an invitation from the Lord in the scriptures or from a uh, representative of his in general conference, we can see his love attached to that invitation every single time without fail. There, there isn't an exception. That's the way it will be every single time. And then in verse 33, here it's reiterated uh, that he, as he's describing, that he invites us to come unto him and partake of his blessings. Then we get to chapter 27. And here in this chapter, the Lord promises to bring forth the Book of Mormon in the last days to save a fallen world. So he says, you need the Book of Mormon to have the Spirit. You need the Spirit to overcome pride. You need pride, or you need to get rid of pride to hearken unto me, and you need to hearken unto me to get my blessing. Okay, well, then the Lord's going to do his part. He's going to give us the first step, and that is the Book of Mormon. So here in verse 9, we find, where is verse 9? We find it. But the book, the Book of Mormon, shall be delivered unto a man, and he shall deliver the words of the book. So not the actual book, but the words of the book, which are the words of those who have slumbered in the dust, or those who guys who died a long time ago. And he shall deliver the words unto another. So the, this book is going to be given to a man. The man's going to read the book and give those words, those audible words, to another. And <clears throat> what was the last one? Oh, and the words of, from the book are going to be from prophets and apostles who lived a long time ago. This is the Book of Mormon. 
So those who have slumbered, those who have previously died, were the ones who recorded their testimonies and the teachings and doctrines on the plates that would be translated as the Book of Mormon. There was a man who was given that plate, those plates, those, that book. That man is Joseph Smith. He dictated the words from the, uh, of the book of, that would become the Book of Mormon to a man by the name of Oliver Cowdery in this house pictured behind me. On April, uh, uh, on, I don't know what I was going to go there, uh, <laughs> despite it. Uh, so Oliver Cowdery is living in Palmyra when Joseph and Emma are living here. Uh, Oliver is, is working as a, a school teacher, and he's uh, teaching some of Joseph Smith's younger siblings. Now, as was customary in those days, the teacher room and boarded with some of the uh, with the family of some of his students. So Oliver Cowdery was living with the Smith family in Palmyra while Joseph was living here. Oliver starts to hear these stories about gold plates and angels and all this stuff about a member of the Smith family of whom he's living with. And so he starts to ask Father Smith, what am I to make of all these stories about your son, these angels, gold plates and things? Father Smith says, just leave it. You know, don't, don't question me about it. Just you do your school work, I'll do my farm work, and that'll be it. Well, Oliver Cowdery kept kind of pestering him about it. Finally, Father Smith, he tells him. He tells him the story. He tells him everything about the angel Moroni and the gold plates and my son's down in harmony and he's starting to translate the plates. Why was Father Smith so hesitant to reveal all the, all the truths initially? Because of the persecution. He wasn't anxious to reopen that can of worms and have the persecution follow the Smith family again. But after gaining Oliver Cowdery's trust, he says, okay, here's the story. Oliver Cowdery says, well, I'm gonna go down to Harmony and meet your pro the, prophet, uh, the prophet and find out if this work is true. Now, why is Father Smith said, Oliver Cowdery, you don't need to go to Harmony to know if these things are true. You can pray and by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the truth of all things. And so, Oliver Cowdery records in his journal that after school was dismissed late in the afternoon, he stayed behind in the schoolhouse. He knelt down and prayed to know if the work that is coming forth of this ancient scripture, if it was true. He wrote in his journal that he felt it. Undeniable. The spirit entered into his heart and he knew that the work was true. Now he went back to Father Smith and said, I'm going to go to Harmony to meet with your son, not to find out if the work is true. I already know that it is. I'm going to go down and assist in the work. So Oliver Cowdery shows up on the doorstep here of this home. And he says, I'm Oliver Cowdery. I've come to inquire about the work. And Joseph Smith replies simply, Mr. Cowdery, it's nice to meet you. I've been expecting you. Time would pass and Oliver Cowdery would come back to that conversation. What do you mean you were expecting me? Joseph says, I prayed for a scribe and the Lord sent you. He totally knew he was coming because he had prayed for it. So as we read in verse nine, here, here we go. This is where the fulfillment of verse nine took place. Joseph would dictate the words of the book to another who would scribe them out. We know them as Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. We then get a little bit further, and this is all about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, the, the translation process. Nephi is prophesying of it all. Excuse me, Isaiah is prophesying of it all, as quoted by Nephi. Then we get to verse 12. As part of this translation process, wherefore at that day, in the last days, when the book, the Book of Mormon, shall be delivered unto the man, Joseph Smith, of whom I have spoken, the book shall be hid from the eyes of the world. Joseph Smith's going to be the only one to see it, the plates. He's going to, keep, he's going to be commanded by the angel Moroni to show the plates to no one, as prophesied, and that's exactly what happened. And then we continue on, that the eyes of none shall behold it, save it be that three witnesses shall behold it by the power of God, besides him, Joseph Smith, to whom the book shall be delivered. And they, the three witnesses, shall testify to the truth of the book and the things therein. There would be three witnesses, namely that same Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, and Martin Harris. These three individuals would become known as the three witnesses. After Joseph and Emma and Oliver moved from this home in Harmony, Pennsylvania, they moved in with the Whitmer family 
in Fayette, New York. Mother and father, Whitmer. Peter, Sr., and Mary, Whitmer. They had a bunch of kids. One of them was named David, David Whitmer. So they complete the translation of the Book of Mormon, but just prior to completing the translation of the Book of Mormon, the Lord identifies Martin, David, and Oliver would be the fulfillment of that ancient prophecy. So one day, Joseph and those three individuals, they left the farmhouse, they went out into the woods, and they began to pray. They each took a turn in praying. First Joseph, and then another, then another, then the fourth, whatever order it may have been in. And they each prayed that, that the fulfillment of this prophecy might be realized right then. They were praying for the witness to happen. And then nothing happened. And so they sit around and they think and they look at Joseph. He, he doesn't know why it's not happening. And then Martin Harris, he says, you know what? It's because of me. I'm not worthy to be here. So he excuses himself and leaves. And Martin Harris's story is a wonderful story for another day. And so now Joseph, Oliver, and David begin praying. As soon as the third one completes that prayer, asking the Lord to reveal the plates and let them be witnesses, the angel Moroni appears. Big table, the plates are on them, the Urim and Thumb's there, the Leahona is there, and the Sword of Laban, and uh, they get to see it all. And the angel Moroni lets them examine all those artifacts. And then the voice from heaven, the Lord's, giving them a strict command that for the rest of their life, they must testify of these things to the world. After that experience, Joseph went and found Martin Harris. They began praying together. The heavens opened, the angel came down, and Martin Harris had the exact same experience as David, Oliver, and Joseph had previously had. So now we had the three witnesses in addition to Joseph. Martin was also given that strict command from the Lord to testify to the world for the rest of their lives that these things were true. Their testimony, their collective testimony, is found in the front page of every copy of the Book of Mormon in any language the Book of Mormon has ever been translated in and been spread throughout every corner of the world hundreds and thousands and millions of times over again. The prophecy from the Lord or the promise from Him that their testimony would go throughout the world has certainly come to pass. The commandment to be faithful and true to their testimony until the day they die was fulfilled by each of them as well. Now I'll have to do another video on these three witnesses because their stories are incredible. But each individual, for one reason or another, which we can identify in a different video, they all found themselves outside the church. Two of the three came back into full fellowship in the church, but all three, as proof and evidence in newspaper publications, late in their life they were still clinging, holding tight, and declaring from the rooftop their testimony of the Book of Mormon. We then get a little bit further in chapter 27, and we get down to verse 13. And the Lord says, And there is none other which shall view it, except for these three and Joseph, save it be a few according to the will of God. And there have been a few who have seen the plates. Do you remember David and his genealogy here? David Whitmer was the son of Peter and Mary. Mary Whitmer had a wonderful experience in which she saw the plates. <clears throat> another video for another day. But also, we have in the front page of every Book of Mormon throughout the entire world, world regardless of language it's been translated into, are the testimony of eight witnesses. Eight men who saw the plates get shown to them by the prophet Joseph. Where did they see them? happened to be in what we call now the Sacred Grove in upstate New York is where they saw the plates. And they were able to see and examine the plates. And now their testimony is also recorded there. Like the three witnesses, some of the eight witnesses, they decided to leave the church. But they never, ever left their testimony of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. And that can be proven through journal entries, acquaintances, and again, newspaper publications in which there are additional testimonies later in their lives, were published throughout the world to see and hear as well. Then we get to chapters, and, and now we're still, the Isaiah is talking about him coming forth of the Book of Mormon, quoted by Nephi, and uh, more of the process of that coming forth. 
is found in verses 15 through 19. I'm not going to read all that to you, but you can read it. The man that they're speaking about is Martin Harris. Martin Harris, before Oliver Cowdery showed up, he came down to this house to check on the work, to see how Joseph Smith was doing. Martin Harris had a testimony that the work was true. He was, in fact, he was financing it a little bit at this point in chronological history. He would finance the whole thing of the publication later. Well, not nearly the whole thing. There's a couple of other contributors, but Martin Harris contributed a huge amount of money towards the publication of the Book of Mormon. So early in the, in the process, before the transcripts were really going, um, Martin Harris comes down to this home just to check in. Martin, uh, Joseph, how are things going? You know, how's the work down here? And what happened is Joseph, he transcribed a few of the characters from the plates onto a piece of paper. And with this piece of paper, you could look at it and say, well, oh, I can't see the plates, but that's what's written on the plates. Martin Harris took that piece of paper and went and did what is recorded in verses 15 through 19. So 15 through 19, you can read the ancient prophecy. But now I'm going to read to you a couple of verses out of church history about this experience coming to pass. Martin Harris says, with that transcript, I went to the city of New York and presented the characters which had been translated. So Joseph wrote down the characters on this piece of paper. He also wrote down the interpretation of those characters on another piece of paper. With those two pieces of paper, Martin Harris heads off to New York City to find a linguist, somebody who's super smart with ancient languages. And he's, he's looking to say, hey, is this a good translation? Is this for real? So I went to the city of New York and presented the characters which had been translated with the translation thereof to Professor Charles Anthon a gentleman celebrated for his literary attainments. Professor Anthon stated that the translation was correct, more so than any he had seen before from the Egyptian. I then showed him those which were not yet translated, and he said that they were Egyptian, Chaldec, Assyriac, and Arabic. And he said that they were true characters. He gave me a certificate certifying to the people of Palmyra that they were true characters and that the translation of such of them had been translated was also correct. I took the certificate, put it in my pocket, and was just leaving the house when Mr. Anthon called me back and asked me how the young man had found out that there were gold plates in the place where he had found them. I answered that an angel of God had revealed it unto him. He then said unto me, Let me see that certificate. I accordingly took it out of my pocket and gave it to him. When he took it and tore it into pieces, saying that there was no such thing now as ministering angels, and that if I would bring the plates to him, he would translate them. I informed him that part of the plates were sealed, and that I was forbidden to bring them. He replied, I cannot read a sealed book. I left him and went to Dr. Mitchell, who sanctioned what Pro Pro Professor Anthon had said respecting both the characters and the translation. Now, as far as can be told or learned or understood, Martin Harris wrote of that experience prior to knowing that it was a fulfillment of ancient prophecy. And we can look at the timeline and see that that is more than likely the way that it happened. Now we get to verses 20 through 21. Now, this is interesting. Whereas the entire Book of Mormon, Moroni and others say, is directed at us as Latter-day Saints and to the whole world in the last days, these few verses, the Lord is speaking just to Joseph. It would have been incredible as Joseph is translating to see that this is for me. The Lord is speaking to the translator, this individual. So as you look at verses 22, or 20 and 21 and even to 22, you'll see that the Lord is speaking specifically to his prophet as the translation of the book is being had. In verse 22, wherefore, the Lord is still speaking directly to Joseph, when thou hast read the words which I have commanded thee. So when the translation process is going to be over. Um, 
and obtain the witnesses, which I have promised unto thee. So after you translate, after you get the witnesses, then shalt thou seal up the book again, and hide it up unto me, that I may preserve the words which thou hast not read, until I shall see fit in mine own wisdom to reveal all things unto the children of men. Okay, so we find in the previous verses, verses 15 through 19, that there's a sealed portion of the plates. So the plates that Joseph got from the angel Moroni, a bunch of those plates he could look at, a bunch more was sealed off. He wasn't allowed to look into them and see what, it, what what's recorded there. And the Lord says now, okay, as soon as you translate what I told you to translate, as soon as you have the witnesses, then I want you to seal these records back up. I want you to put them back in the hill. Oliver Cowdery testified that that's exactly what they did, that he and Joseph Smith went back to the hill in upstate New York and redeposited the plates. In the front of the Book of Mormon is the testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith. And in the end, near the end of that testimony, he says, if I can't find it just right super quick because I'm not turning it fast enough, I'll just quote it from memory. He says, but here it is. But by the wisdom of God, they remain, meaning the plate safe in my hands until I had accomplished by them what was required of uh, until, oh, I lost my place. But, but by the wisdom of God, they, meaning the plates, remained safe in my hands until I had accomplished by them what was required at my hand. What was accomplished? We find that in verse 22 of chapter 27 of 2 Nephi. When, according to arrangements, the messenger called for them, messenger meaning the angel Moroni, I delivered them up to him, according to Oliver Cowdery, at the hill, and he has them in his charge until this day, being the day that he recorded that statement, which was the 2nd of May, 1838. And so the Lord says, this is what's going to happen. You're going to give them back. And I'm going to hold on to them until I see fit to present the sealed portion and let the Latter-day Saints read the rest of the Book of Mormon. Verse 22 was fulfilled, uh, as recorded by the prophet Joseph Smith. And then in verse 21, let's remember, there is more to come. Touch not the things which are sealed, for I will bring them forth in mine own due time. Someday, the Lord will allow us to read the rest of the Book of Mormon. So what's in the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon? What have we yet to know? From the church's website, I quote, When Moroni was finishing the Book of Mormon record, he was commanded to seal up some of the plates, and Joseph Smith was later commanded not to translate them. This sealed portion contains the complete record of the vision of the brother of Jared. We know that because of Ether chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. This vision included, quote, from that verse, all things from the foundation of the world until the end thereof. So basically, the Lord revealed, I'm still quoting from the church's website, so basically the Lord revealed to the brother of Jared the history of mankind. And the sealed portion of the plates was Moroni's translated copy of it. Few people have seen the sealed record. For instance, the Nephites in the land bountiful at the Savior's coming and Moroni all saw it. Saw it. The Lord said that the sealed portion would be revealed to the world Quote, in my own due time, which we just read. He also said it would not go forth unto the Gentiles until the day that they shall repent of their iniquity and come clean before the Lord. What is that iniquity? And how do we become clean? In Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord gives us a little bit of a hint. In fact, it's not a hint. It's a big slap in the face where he says that speaking collectively, not individually, both church is under condemnation for having taken the Book of Mormon lightly. So why is the Lord going to give us more of something that we already take lightly? He's not. So how do we repent of our iniquity? What is our iniquity? Take it, collectively speaking, taking lightly the Book of Mormon or taking the Book of Mormon lightly. And until we get over that and start taking it for what it is and applying it into our daily lives, the Lord's not going to give us the silver portion. So that's the test right there. When are we going to get it? It's up to the members of the church as to when we're going to get it. 
Joseph Smith or uh, the church website continues on with this description. According to Joseph Smith's associates who saw the golden plates, anywhere from a half to two thirds of the plates were in the sealed portion. Which means that when the sealed portion comes about, the Book of Mormon is going to go from 531 pages to at least 1,062 pages, double. And some people who saw the plate said that the sealed portion was two-thirds of it, which means that the full Book of Mormon is going to be somewhere around 1,500 pages. How amazing is that going to be? All right, let's get into chapter 28, and let's keep going on the Book of Mormon theme. Chapter 28, verse 7. Um, <clears throat> where is my verse 7? It comes after verse 6. Um, yea, and there shall be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and it shall be well with us. In the last days, that's going to be not an actual what they say, but that's going to be the attitude that people are going to have. Let's do whatever we want. For tomorrow we'll die, and it's going to be okay, because in verse 8, the Lord will just be okay with it. He will justify in committing a little sin. Yea, lie a little, take advantage of one because of one's words, take a pit for the neighbor. There's no harm in this. And do all these things, for tomorrow we die. And if it so be that we're guilty, that little thing called the atonement, God will beat us with a few stripes, and at the last day, he'll take care of it in the kingdom of God. And we'll be saved. That's what I like to refer to as transactional repentance. Oh, I sinned. I'll confess. It's like a transaction. I'm just going to check the box. Oh, I confessed. Oh, yep. I eat, drink, and be merry. But I did it. I ate, I drank, and I was merry. And so let me just check this box, which I call repentance. And now I'm just going to move on with my life. And if what I did wasn't sufficient, eh, God will take care of it. I'll be fine. That's an attitude. I like to call it transactional repentance. But this is not repentance. Repentance is becoming a new creature. It's a change of heart. It's moving to a higher and holier ground, which is a process which takes effort, which through the atonement of Jesus Christ and only with his help can we become better. Now, it's important to remember that the Lord just doesn't fill the gaps that we leave out or, or can't attain ourselves, but he fills everything start to finish, and we're invited to join him through that process of repentance. It's not like the Lord says, okay, you go through this repentance as far as you can, and then I'll pick you up where you leave off. No, no, no. The Lord comes and meets us where we are and together escorts us through the repentance process. But it can't be transactional. It's got to be purposeful. It's got to be a complete change of character, not just the doing away of the sin, but becoming higher and holier and closer to him because of doing away with the sin. It's a process, not a transaction. And Brother Wilcox, Brad Wilcox, says this of this point. The atonement of Jesus Christ does not just provide a way to clean up messes. It provides the purpose and desire to avoid making the messes. So if we truly repent... We will not continue to say, eat, drink, and be merry, okay, and now eat, drink, and be merry again, and check the box, and, okay, eat, drink, and be merry again. Yeah, the Lord's going to clean up all that mess, but the change of heart makes it so we have no desire to continue making that mess. Brother Wilcox continues, the atonement doesn't allow us to ignore our appetites or pretend they don't matter but to educate and elevate them. That's the end of his quote. So through the effects of the atonement, through the blessing of the atonement, we will not say, eat, drink, and be merry, because we'll have no desire to live that way. Because the atonement, if we allow it to, will change our heart, and even our appetite, so that we have no desire to be involved in the eat, drink, and be merry attitude. 
Nephi then continues through chapter 8, warning us about false churches. Okay, so keep your membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and you're going to be just fine. I don't think it's quite that simple. When he uses the word churches, I wonder if it's more than just a religious entity that he's warning us against. What other churches could influence us negatively? Well, there's a lot of things out there in the world that will do that. Social media is the hub of that very thing. The hub of people trying to influence us to do stuff. And usually that stuff is not good stuff. So when Nephi says, steer clear of those influential churches, we've got to modernize that language. We've got to steer clear of those influencers who try to get our attention and try to get us to focus on other things. In verse 21, this very thought continues, not, not changing thoughts, but in chapter 28, Verse 21, Nephi continues on with this, and tell me if you see this in the world today. And others will he pacify, or those who get distracted and start focusing on and listening to the influencers, those people or things that are distracting us from the things of God. And others, so those who look away or look to the influencers and the things of the world, and others he will pacify. The adversary will and lull them away into carnal security that they will say all is well in zion yea zion prospereth all is well and thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them away carefully down to hell i want to spend a moment here on this verse there's a lot in it and others will he pacify and lull them away into carnal security what does carnal security mean? Let's break it apart. What does carnal mean? Things of the flesh. What does security mean? Feeling safe and comfortable. You're going to feel safe and comfortable with the things of the world if we listen to the wrong influencers. To lead them away, lull them away into carnal security. The footnote of carnal security is apathy. Definition of apathy is feeling completely indifferent or lacking emotion. Okay, it's no big deal. It's just the way the world is. Well, the world's supposed to be sinful in the last days, so we're just going to accept it. I feel comfortable accepting wickedness all around me. Yeah, that's happening today on a ginormous scale where things that bothered us five years ago, I was going to say 20 years ago, but things that bothered us just five years ago just doesn't bother us anymore because we have carnal security. We feel comfortable with it. Maybe we don't feel comfortable with it, but we're certainly more accepting of sin today than we once were. If we look at morality, the timeline of morality, the world taught this. You know, this level. This is an acceptable level of morality. And the church, or the Lord, teaches not, this is the level of morality, or of goodness, wickedness, you know, of, uh, not goodness and wickedness, but goodness. This is the Lord's standard, and the world says, this is the acceptable, that's the way I should say, this is the Lord's standard of acceptable behavior. This is the world's standard of acceptable behavior. And there's been this gap. Now, as the world's acceptance of sin has decreased, they've lowered the standard, what do we as Latter-day Saints do? Do we maintain the standard or do we maintain the gap? So as the standard, so this is all, what the difference has always been, the Lord's standard and the world's standard of acceptedness. And as the world goes down, are we carnally secure in keeping the gap? We said, well, yeah, we're not, we're not diving into the world, but we are becoming a little bit more accepting of sin. Or as the world degenerates and goes down, are we maintaining that level, the Lord's level, and watching that gap increase? I think that's the warning to individuals in the last days who know better. 
that if we allow, if we look at the influencers, the things that pull us away from the truth, then we're at danger of becoming carnal, feeling a carnal security where we're okay with it. We're okay with lie a little, cheat a little, dig a, t a, a pit for thy neighbor. You know, it was just warned in the previous chapter that we said, oh yeah, we would never do that. Wow, ah, yeah, we see it all around us now, don't we? Or do we say, yeah, you know, what was a bad word five years ago? We would never say, hear that at school. Oh, now it just happens all the time. Or yeah, it wasn't acceptable two or three years ago or 20 years ago, but well, the times change, you know, it's the last days. It's the way it's supposed to be. That's a reflection of a carnal secure heart. And that's what Nephi is warning us against there. Let's continue on. Let's get back to the good stuff. All these warnings have to be have to be taught, but uh, but let's let's get there a little bit uh, in verse twenty four. Well, a little bit more warning here, and then we'll get to the wonderful promises from the Lord to those who can overcome these things. In verse twenty four, <clears throat> therefore, woe be unto him that falls, falls into that carnal security. Woe be unto them that that is at ease in Zion, saying, "Hey." We're comfortable. We're okay. Do I need to do everything that the Lord and the prophet is asking me to do? No, I'll just do most of it. Or I'll just do the stuff that's applicable to me. And I'll be okay with that. And yeah, I'm going to watch this movie. There is that one part, but the majority of it's okay. I'm still keeping that gap, even though the world standard's going way, way, way down. I'm not going all the way down. So... I think that's what Nephi means when he says, woe unto those who are at ease in Zion and not actively countering the effects of the adversary. And this takes us back to the stuff we were talking about in chapter 26, where if we lose the spirit, we're going to go off the deep end really fast. And President Nelson says, whoa, yeah, in order to survive spiritually, you've got you, you to get the spirit into your life and avoid those things. It's all, it's all connected. It's all here together with us. And then in verse 30, For behold, thus saith the Lord God, I will give unto the children of men line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. I'm going to give them everything they need to survive spiritually. And blessed are those who hearken unto my precepts and lend an ear unto my counsel. For they shall learn wisdom. For unto him that receiveth, I will give more. And from them that shall say we have enough, or those who say or live a life of ease in Zion, from them should be taken away, even that which, which they have. And so here, as I read verse 30, I ask myself this question. In response to that counsel, do I listen to what the Lord says? Or do I tell the Lord what I want to hear? And then we get to chapter 29, verses 1 and 2. It's as though the Lord is reminding us again of what he taught us in the previous chapters. And that is, in the last days, I'm going to gather Israel. I'm going to set up an ensign, which in these videos I've defined it rightfully because I take it from the church's website. The ensign is the Book of Mormon and the church. The Lord tells us here again, many will come to gather to that ensign or accept the Book of Mormon and join the church. They'll learn of him and they'll become his covenant people. But despite the Lord's continual reaching out and providing every opportunity, some people will reject the offer. We get to verse 3. And because my word shall hiss forth, many of the Gentiles shall reject it by saying, A Bible, a Bible, we've got a Bible, and there cannot be any more Bible. And then down in verse 10, the Lord, wherefore, because that ye have a Bible, you need not suppose that it contains all my words, neither need you suppose that I have not caused more to be written. And could we not add on to that as a more broad definition of, okay, just because you have the Book of Mormon, Dr. Thomas Pearl, Great Christ, do you think the Lord is silent now? Or is he still speaking through his ordained representatives? And are we accepting of that word through that 
play just as reg readily as we are with the Book of Mormon and with the Bible as well. And then we get to verse or chapter 30. And verse 3, speaking of the Book of Mormon, verse 3, chapter 30. There shall be many which shall, shall believe the words which are written, and they shall carry them forth unto the remnant of our seed. So there's going to be a lot of people that believe in the Book of Mormon. They're not just going to believe it. They're going to literally take them, take those words throughout the world. Verse 5, And the gospel of Jesus Christ shall be declared among them. Wherefore, they shall be restored unto the knowledge of their fathers and also to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, which, has had, which was had among their fathers. So there is going to be a great gathering. And those who turn away from the negative influencers, those who do things to increase the Spirit in their lives, those who do hearken unto the voice of the Lord and unto His chosen representatives, they shall rejoice. As it's recorded in verse 6, they shall rejoice. And it's all key on the Book of Mormon. How do we find reason to rejoice? The Book of Mormon. How do we get the Spirit back into our life? The Book of Mormon. Where do we find the words of him and his prophets that we should hearken unto? The Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is the answer. Now, why is the Book of Mormon the answer? Because it is another testament of Jesus Christ. It points the reader to the Savior. And so it's through the Book of Mormon that we come to know the Savior. And it's the Savior who is the answer to it all. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ.